Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Duels of the Peaks. I'm your host Landon, being joined today with Peter. And if you aren't familiar with Duels of the Peaks, let's go over the rules. This series consists of 12 games of Commander that we'll be going to be playing over the next 12 months. We're adding some point challenges to the game to throw some extra strategy into the mix and encourage different kinds of play styles that normally wouldn't be seen in your average Commander game. We've done this to kind of break up the monotony of just a normal commander game and to maybe give some decks another way of, of winning the game or feel like they're winning the game through different point avenues. Yep, and at the end of the series, the person who has the most points wins the entire series. So let's go over the table challenges. Um, so there, you get three points if you win the game and three points if you are the first player to cast spells from CMC one through six. So yeah, that's at any point in the game. Uh, you, if you've cast spells with converted mana that cost one, two, three, four, five, and six, then you get three points if you're the first player to do so. Next up, you have two points if you reach your devotion to seven if you're monocolored, or 10 if you're two colored. This is kind of going off of the Theros theme uh, for this episode. We want to see the decks building off of this popular mechanic from Theros that maybe doesn't always synergize with the deck, but can push some players to develop interesting strategies. And then the last section, uh, the last challenge we have for the table challenges is one point if you say Uno first when another player has one card left in their hand. Just kind of a silly goal for for us. We we wanted to include something that was worth fewer points, but still something you kind of have to pay attention to other players' hands. Even if you've already lost the game. Even if you, yeah, those people that have already been kicked out of the game will still have a chance to get that point. All right, I, Landon's going to start us off with some deck intros. All of these decks have deck techs that we've produced previously on this channel. So we'll link those in the description. Go check those out if you're more interested in the mechanics of that specific deck. First up, we have Griffin playing Perforos, the Bronze Blooded. His personal challenge for his deck is to deal 20 or more damage to each opponent in one turn. His opening hand consists of Berserker's Onslaught, Mob Rule, Hedron Archive, Myriad Landscape, Spine Rock Knoll, Mountain and Mountain. Next, we have Landon playing Siona, Hero of Peleus. And his personal challenge is to have six lands enchanted with auras at one time. His opening hand consists of Song of the Dryads, Voyaging Seder, Alpha Status, Selesnya Sanctuary, Bountiful Promenade, Plains, and Forest. Peter is playing Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. His challenge is to escape Uro five times during the game. His opening hand consists of Flood of Tears, Teamer Sabretooth, Coiling Oracle, Sapphire Medallion, Vivid Grove, and Two Islands. And then Caleb is playing Thassa Deep Dwelling. His challenge is to mill an opponent down to one card. His opening hand is Mystical Tutor, Ghostly Flicker, Cloudkin Seer, Torrential Gear Hulk, Maze of Ith, and Two Islands. One more thing to mention is everybody at the table is completely ignorant of the other personal challenges of the other players. So we have no idea what the other person's personal challenge is. It's kind of a secret and that is adds a pretty nice dynamic to, to the game. Yeah, definitely. They, there are some decisions that that take into account these personal challenges that they're trying to, to achieve that may not otherwise be uh, smart decisions during the game. And so the players kind of have to weigh uh, what's going to get them the most points, what's going to win them the game, what's the best thing to be doing right now to achieve those goals. So with the deck intros out of the way and the explanations, let's get right into the game. All right, Griffin's going to go Start first and Landon's going to be announcing the plays that they're making, uh, and I'm I'm going to be chipping in with some extra context to to what's going on in the game. Griffin starts us off, draws for his turn, and plays down Spine Rock Knoll, hiding away a card. He then passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, plays down Bountiful Promenade as his land for turn, and passes to Peter. Peter draws, plays down Vivid Grove with nothing else, passes to Caleb. Caleb draws, plays down an island, and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down his Myriad Landscape tapped as his land for turn and passes to Landon. Landon plays down his forest and casts the first spell of the game with Season of Growth with nothing else passes to Peter. 
Peter draws, plays down an island, and taps both to play down his sapphire medallion, and with nothing else to do, ships the turn over to Caleb. Caleb draws, plays down an island, and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps his lands, plays down a mountain for turn, and passes the turn over to Landon. Landon untaps his lands, draws, and taps two to play down his Voyaging Seder, which is going to trigger his Season of Growth, which is going to let him scry. He then plays down his Selesnia Sanctuary as his land for turn, bouncing the tapped forest back to his hand. He then passes the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps. Peter now has enough mana with that Sapphire Medallion to play his commander. It looks like he's going to do so. Yeah, he casts Uro, and the triggers are going to go on the stack. He's going to gain three life, draw a card, and put an island into play. He then has to sacrifice Uro as he did not escape it. And then on Peter's end step, Griffin is going to crack his myriad landscape to go search for two basic mountains, putting them into play tapped. With no further game actions, the turn goes to Caleb. Caleb untaps, draws, plays down Mazavith as an unfortunate land for turn. Yeah, that, that that doesn't look good for him. We saw all three of those lands in his opening hand, and uh, if he hasn't drawn anything since then, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard. He, Thassa only costs four, so... Um, he's two turns away. At he, least. He's, he's at least two turns away from getting some value out of that, since Mazavith doesn't tap for any minute. With nothing else, he passes the turn over to Griffin, who untaps all of his lands and draws... He then plays down a mountain for turn and turns everything sideways to cast Perforos. Griffin, on the other hand, has hit every land drop, uh, doing really good. Perforos, dangerous threat on the board to get out this early. He passes to Landon, who untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn. He then taps three mana to cast Enchantress's Presence, and he untaps the slicing of Sanctuary with his Voyaging Seder, and he attempts to make a deal with Griffin let's at this point. Go, let's go to that now. Um, Tim, I won't hurt you if you don't hit me with whatever you're going to put into play with Perforos. Can you make uh, that promise? So, you won't hurt Perforos if I don't attack you with my thing? For like a couple of turns, yeah. One turn. One turn, not enough. So that deal does not, that deal falls through and Landon enchants Perforos with Song of the Dryads, which is going to trigger his Enchantress's presence and draw a card, and now Perforos is a tree. Peter then untaps and draws, and taps three mana to cast Kodama's Reach, finding a forest on the field and an island into his hand, and then he plays that island as his land for turn. With nothing else to do, he passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb draws with nothing to untap and plays down Castle Vantress as his land for turn. Griffin then begs Caleb to bounce Song of the Dryads. I'm so mad. I am so mad. <laughs> Well, I have a. a uh, I mean, like, I, I will. I will go I made, ham on Landon. I made you a deal, and you didn't like the deal. I so. will go ham, please. Can't do it yet. Ah! <laughs> Caleb then pays three mana to cast Cloud Conceer, and when it enters the battlefield, he gets to draw a card. After that, he doesn't have anything left to do, and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin's really desperate here. He's got to have Perforos out. He untaps and draws, and plays down a mountain as his land for turn. He comes out of a volcano. And then just like <laughs> turns into a, a tree. Turns into a tree. It's like, <laughs> no. And he then uses his Perforos that's a tree as a mana to cast Inferno Titan. With the Inferno Titan trigger on the stack, he targets Cloud Conceer and Voyaging Seder, killing them both. With nothing else, he passes the turn over to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a Plains as his land for turn and taps two mana to cast Starfield Mystic, which is going to trigger his season of growth and he's going to scry the top card of his library. After that, he's going to play Cultivate, searching for a forest into play and a plains into his hand. With nothing else, Landon passes the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn, and taps a green and a blue to cast Coiling Oracle, which when it enters a battlefield, he's going to reveal a Growing Rites of Itlamok and putting that into his hand. He then casts said Growing Rites of Itlamok. He then reveals the top four cards of his library with the Growing Rites Enter the Battlefield trigger, revealing no creatures to put into his hand, and with nothing else, passes the turn to Caleb. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that Peter is missing a lot of these opportunities here. He, it looks like he might be struggling a little bit on getting lands into his hand as well as getting more bodies on the field to protect him as well as getting more cards in his graveyard to get Uro out again. It looks like he's just a little bit down on that card advantage. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays an island for turn. And there's a little bit of an interaction here with Caleb and Landon. Let's go to that. I hate your stuff, dude. Why? Because the second I play Thassa, she's going to become a an indestructible bug. That I don't have Dark Simutation in this deck. I promise. Swearsies. With Caleb's fears quelled, he sees that it's safe to cast his commander. With nothing else, passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down his mountain for turn. He then casts Berserker's Onslaught, to which Peter is very quick to counter with a timely swan song. 
Yes, definitely don't want something that's giving even more damage to that Inferno Titan, even if it means uh, Peter's now a target to that Inferno Titan um, when he's already struggling. Took one for the team. Tim then moves to combat, swinging with that Inferno Titan at Peter, with the Inferno Titan trigger going on the stack, being able to do three damage to Coiling Oracle and Starfield Mystic. With that on the stack, Landon responds to the declaring attackers with a Path to Exile, exiling the Inferno Titan. The Path to Exile is going to resolve, exiling the Inferno Titan, gaining Griffin's six life, and then the Inferno Titan trigger resolves, killing the Starfield Mystic and the Coiling Oracle. Peter will take no damage as the Inferno Titan is exiled, and with nothing else, Griffin will pass the turn to Landon. So yeah, a lot of stuff happened there. Uh, Landon, it looks like he was a little bit late at casting that Path to Exile. He couldn't save his Starfield Mystic there. Um, but he does save Peter from a lot of damage coming at him, and uh, he quells down the threat of of Griffin's board for at least another turn. Landon untaps and draws. Landon immediately goes to cast his Verdurin Enchantress, which when enters the battlefield is going to give him another season of growth trigger, letting him scry, keeps it on top. He then casts Alpha Status, targeting his Verdurin Enchantress, and that's going to trigger his season of growth, Enchantress's presence, and Verdurin Enchantress, letting him draw a total of three cards. This is where Landon's deck gets a little bit crazy. All of these Enchantress effects adding up, netting him a ton of cards, um, and it's only gonna get worse as he gets more and more of these Enchantress effects. He then plays the Planes as his land for turn which he drew, and he taps the remaining mana that he has to cast Satessin Champion, another Enchantress, letting him get another season of growth trigger and he scries the card and leave it, leaves it on top. With no further game actions, he ships the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and then casts his enchantment Leyline of Anticipation and with nothing else passes the turn holding up some mana for interaction. Caleb going to his turn untaps and draws and plays down his Reliquary Tower as his land for turn, taps some mana to cast his Solemn Simulacrum which is going to go find him a basic island and to play tapped, and with nothing else he goes to his end step and Thassa triggers, blinking the Solemn Simulacrum to go and find him another island and to play tapped. With no further game actions, the turn goes to Griffin. It's turn six here. Caleb is, is finally getting some advantage here with the land. Solemn Simulacrum and Thassa work so well together to get all of those lands together, um, especially in the state that he's in. That was uh, that was a really smart play here. Looks like everyone's kind of got a, a, a good mana base. Not really anything obvious that's going to that's gonna end the game right now, especially with Perforos yes. under the Song of the Dryads as a, as a forest right now. So uh, let's Let's see how this plays out. Griffin going to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays down his mountain as his land for turn. He then warns everybody at the table that this is going to be quite the wacky turn as he casts Mob Rule. He steals Landon's creatures and the Solemn Simulacrum, immediately goes to combat and swings everything at Landon. With no blockers being declared, Landon takes seven damage. With that damage resolving, going to a second main phase, Griffin then casts Fires of Invention that was exiled underneath the Spine Rock Knoll's hideaway. That then gives him all of the triggers off of Landon's Enchantress's effects, and he then gets to draw a bunch of cards. Using the Fires of Invention, he gets to cast the Heartless Hita Segu for free, which is a very scary card to have. And with nothing else, he goes to his end step, returning everything he stole back to Landon and Caleb. That Fires of Invention is very good in this sneak attack-esque deck where he's not necessarily aiming to cast lots of creatures, he, he's aiming to sneak them out with Perforos. At Landon going to his turn, untaps his lands and draws. He then goes to cast his commander, Siona. Landon then gets a Season of Growth trigger off of Siona entering the battlefield and he scries the card to the bottom of his library. Siona is then going to trigger and reveal the top seven cards of his library and Landon gets to reveal an aura to put into his hand. Lennon takes the card Canopy Cover as the aura and puts that directly into his hand. He then casts Core Spirit Dancer. When that enters the battlefield, he gets another Season of Growth trigger, leaving that scryed card on top. He then casts Canopy Cover, which is going to trigger Season of Growth, Enchantress's Presence, Verdurin Enchantress, Satessin Champion, Core Spirit Dancer to draw him five cards and Siona is going to trigger and make him a soldier token, which is then going to trigger Season of Growth again. After that, Lennon plays down Sun Petal Grove untapped as his land for turn. Next up, Landon is going to cast Utopia Sprawl, which is going to trigger his Enchantress's Presence, his Verdurin Enchantress, Cetessian Champion, Core Spirit Dancer, to draw him four cards total. After which, Landon goes to combat and swings the Cetessian Champion at Peter, who is going to take the five damage. And with nothing else, he moves to his end step and discards cards. 
And then Peter responds to the end step by flashing in his Thassa's Oracle to rearrange the top cards of his library. Super powerful move from Landon this turn. He drew 10 cards off of his Intantious effects over the entire turn. Uh, a lot of value coming out of these Enchantress effects, and you can see his board state is now massive. He, he's, he definitely hit his devotion this turn, uh, so he gets those two points, and uh, and he's looking really good, really solid in, in this game. With no further game actions, Peter goes to his turn, untaps, and draws the card that he put on top with Thassa's Oracle, which happens to be Devastation Tide with a miracle cost of one and a blue. He then opts to cast that De Devastation Tide, bouncing all non-land permanents back to their owner's hands. An interesting interaction is since Perforos is considered a forest right now, the Song of the Dryads is going to go back to Landon's hand, and Perforos will actually stay on the battlefield as a Devastation Tide resolves. Seems like a little bit of an oversight by Peter here. Uh, Perforos, the only thing that was dealing with him was that Song of the Dryads being there. Hopefully the, the board can deal with that Perforos uh, before it, it it does some major damage here. Peter then recasts his Growing Rites of Itlamok, which when enters the battlefield reveals the top four cards of his library, and he reveals a Tatio of a Benthic Druid, which he's going to put into his hand. He then recasts his Sapphire Medallion, to which Caleb responds by casting a Mystical Tutor to go find a Muddle the Mixture to put on top of his library. The Sapphire Medallion then res resolves, and with no further game actions, he passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb then goes to his turn, untaps all of his lands, and draws the Muddle the Mixture that he tutored for. He then taps three lands to cast Narset, Parter of Veils, to which Landon responds by cycling his Sigil of the Nyan Gods to draw a card while he can. Definitely a bad sign for Landon here. Uh, that Narset completely shuts off all of those Enchantress effects that are drawing him cards. Um, I'm sure Landon's hoping for a way to deal with that very quickly. Caleb decides to pass the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps all of his lands and plays down his mountain for turn. He then goes to make a deal with Caleb. We'll hear that right now. I will not kill Narset if you don't return or bounce or do anything to my board this turn. I will not bounce anything on your board this turn as long as it doesn't come at me. Okay, that's fine. All right, deal. Looks like Griffin's got some big plans for this turn. He just really didn't want Caleb to bounce anything on this board. With that deal out of the way, Griffin moves to casting his Fires of Invention. He then activates the Fires of Invention to cast Avatar of Slaughter for free. He then puts in Heartless Heat of Segu into play with Perforos' activated ability, giving the Heartless Heat of Segu haste. He then activates the Heat of Segu to cut everybody's life total in half. After that resolves, he goes to combat with Perforos and swings that at Landon and Avatar of Slaughter at Peter. Landon and Peter both declare no blockers and go down to three life. And Griffin then meets his personal challenge of dealing over 20 damage to each opponent in a single turn. Peter is now seriously regretting bouncing that Song of the Dryads when he did, I, and you know now he's really hurt, and, and Landon is looking in a really bad place too, with no board state that he previously had, as well as, you know, he's down to three life, so. Perforos could sneeze at this point and Landon would die. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's a really bad board state for half the table. With no further game actions, Griffin ships the turn over to Landon. Landon goes to his turn, untaps his lands, and draws a card, and at this point, Caleb makes a comment about how he thinks he hosed the wrong person this round. <laughs> Just goes to show you how the fear of Perforos was rightly placed throughout this game. Seeing that he was able to do that much damage in one turn was ridiculous. Um, Landon then goes to try and deal with what's going on on the board and cast Song of the Dryads targeting the Avatar of Slaughter. And then he casts the Nature's Claim targeting the Fires of Invention, which when that resolves is going to destroy it and give Griffin four life. Landon taps some more mana and recasts his Core Spirit Dancer and casts Danitha Capuchin. He casts Canopy Cover targeting the Core Spirit Dancer but missing the draw because of Narset and going to his end step, discards a whole bunch of cards. Peter goes to his turn and untaps and draws, plays down an island as his land for turn. And in an effort to reset the board again, Peter casts Flood of Tears, bouncing everything, but the Avatar of Slaughter is going to stay on the battlefield again because of the way that these board wipes or these bounce spells are worded. And Peter's gonna reach that three point challenge. He's cast convert a mana cost one through six at this point, uh, which which he says is the primary motive behind doing that because Flood of Tears was six mana. And he probably wouldn't have done it if he wouldn't have just dropped a three life on his last turn. After the Flood of Tears, 
Peter casts Thassa's Oracle, rearranging the top cards of his library. After the Thassa's Oracle trigger's been resolved, he goes to his end step, to which Caleb responds and casts Venser, bouncing the Avatar of Slaughter back to Griffin's hand. He goes to untap and he draws and plays down an island as his land for turn. Caleb at this point starts asking to see what's in graveyards for some suspicious reason. Yeah, I wonder what he has in his deck that he could be possibly pulling out at this point. Maybe something that enters the battlefield and casts something from graveyards? Well, we'll have to see. After taking a look at the graveyards, he then decides to cast his commander, Thassa, and then goes to his end step and blinks Venser with Thassa's ability and returns a mountain back to Griffin's hand. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays down his mountain for turn. He then taps his mana to cast Perforos again, and he activates Perforos to put Runehorn Hellkite into play with haste and goes to combat, to which Caleb responds by tapping down the Runehorn Hellkite with Thassa's activated ability. And with his combat step kind of nerfed, Griffin goes to his end step and has to sacrifice the Hellkite due to Perforos' ability. Landon goes to his turn, untaps his land, and prepares to rebuild his board again. He plays down a forest as his land for turn, recasts Danita to get some reduction on the rest of his enchantments for the rest of the turn, he then casts Core Spirit Dancer and recasts Song of the Dryads targeting the Perforos, which is going to trigger his Core Spirit Dancer to let him draw a card. He's going to take full advantage of the fact that Narset is no longer on the board. Get as many draw triggers as he can out of this. He then casts Utopia Sprawl, which is again going to trigger the Spirit Dancer to give him another card. He then casts Canopy Cover, targeting the Spirit Dancer, which is going to give him another card. He then casts Gift of Immortality on Danita, which is going to trigger the Spirit Dancer to give him another card. With nothing else, he goes to his end step and discards a, some cards, one of which being Savine's Reclamation, which is a notable card because he can actually cast it for flashback to get some extra value. Super powerful card to have in this deck, especially with the number of auras that he has uh, that will most likely be removed and, and put on, into the graveyard. Peter goes to untap and draws. He then immediately escapes Uro, exiling five cards from his graveyard. When Uro enters the battlefield, he's going to gain three life, draw a card, and put a forest into play. And after that, he taps four mana to cast the enchantment greater good greater good if you've seen the deck tech it it's really valuable with uro on the field he's drawing six cards and discarding three cards every time he activates it uh fueling the graveyard as well as getting him a ton of cards one cast of uro will give him seven cards with nothing else he ships the turn over to caleb Caleb goes to untap and draws, and taps two mana to recast his Sapphire Medallion. He then casts his Torrential Gear Hork for five mana with a reduction from the Sapphire Medallion, and casts with the Enter the Battlefield trigger from the Gear Hulk Mystical Tutor to go and grab Tunnel Vision to put it on top of his library. He then goes to combat and swings Thassa and Venser both at Griffin, who declares no blockers and takes eight damage. At the end of his turn, Thassa will trigger and blinks the Venser to return it, and when that enters the battlefield, he sends Danita back to Landon's hand. Caleb gets Tunnel Vision here, obviously important for his um, his challenge, milling an opponent down to one. Uh, he's got kind of a combo in here where he can uh, uh, put something on the bottom of his, their deck and then use Tunnel Vision to mill them down to that card. Uh, that's kind of the main strategy that he built the deck around, so hopefully we can see him get that out and somewhat, maybe even Griffin. Griffin goes to his turn, untapping his lands and drawing, and plays down a mountain as his land for turn. He then goes and recasts Heartless Hita Segu, and after that he casts Neheb the Eternal. Feels bad uh, hard casting these uh, non hasty creatures. Which were put in there to be hit with Perforos' ability. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so yeah, yeah, he's kind of in a stuck position here. Landon untaps and draws. He goes and recasts Danita. He then casts Armadillo Cloak, targeting the Spirit Dancer, which triggers and draws him a card. He then casts Snake Umbra, targeting the Spirit Dancer, which is going to trigger Spirit Dancer and draw him another card. He then Cast Savine's Reclamation for its flashback cost from the graveyard, getting back Gift of Immortality and Sigil of the Nine Gods, attaching both to the Spirit Dancer, getting two more triggers on the Spirit Dancer, drawing him two more cards, and bringing the Spirit Dancer up to a 16-18. But in the game, we kind of did some bad math and we thought that it was only a 15-17. This doesn't affect the game in any major way. We just wanted to point out that we ended up catching that it was supposed to be a 16-18. He then goes to combat and swings the unblockable spirit dancer at Griffin for 16 damage, but we're only marking it as 15 because we're bad at math, causing Landon to gain 15 life, and he's going to draw a card off of the snake umbra. After having drawn five cards this turn, Landon moves to discard, and with no further game actions, ships the turn over to Peter, but Peter says that he's actually going to sacrifice Uro at the end step to greater good, drawing six cards and discarding three. 
After that, Peter goes to his turn, untaps his lands, and draws for turn. He then casts Grapple of the Past, milling three and returning. While Peter's thinking about what to return, uh, the rest of the players on the board that have more serious board states are considering what to do with Landon's board. So can you on your turn bounce the enchantment and then the creature? No. Okay. I could do... I'm not swinging Core Spirit Dancer at you though, so... (laughs) It'll be the you'll be the last one to deal with it. Peter f- grabs the forest with the grapple of the past ability, and then immediately goes to escaping Uro, paying four mana and exiling five cards from his graveyard. When Uro enters, he's going to gain three life and draw and put a forest into play. He then plays a forest as his land for turn, and then moves to sacrificing Uro to the greater good, drawing six more cards and discarding three. He then sacrifices the Thassa's Oracle to Greater Good, drawing one card and discarding three, which gives him enough cards in the graveyard to escape Uro again, gaining three more life, drawing a card, and putting a forest into play, and then moves to discard. It looks like Peter has a worse board state than he did last turn. Uh, He now has one creature rather than two. Uh, It was probably kind of a bad idea to, to only leave that one up, especially with other people having such big boards at this state. Um, but we'll see if he can make it to his next turn. He's obviously trying to do his his challenge of escaping Uro five times. He then passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws. It's kind of surprised at what was on top. Kind of forgot about that tunnel vision. He then recasts Narset. Peter responds to the Narset wanting to get a little bit of value left by sacrificing the Uro to the greater good, drawing six cards and discarding three. Yeah, this is this is really bad for Peter. He should not have done that. He would have been able to probably survive a blow from from Caleb swinging everything at him because he at least had a blocker, um, and he's been gaining life. So it it's really hard to watch him do this right now. Caleb transmutes his Muddle the Mixture, and which lets him go and find a card with CMC2. He snags Thassa's Oracle with that. He then moves to combat and swings everything at Peter, to, and Peter, having sacrificed his Uro, has no blockers, and he dies. Rip in peace, Peter. Rip in peace, Peter. Rip in peace. Yeah, as I said before, Peter sacrificing Uro was probably the biggest mistake he could have made. He probably would have survived another turn had he saved that. Of course, if someone else had swung at him or or anything like that, they probably would have done enough damage to, to end him. But Caleb only had 13 power on the board. There, there definitely was something he could have done about that. And maybe Caleb wouldn't have even swung if, if Oro would, would have stayed on the board. So Lessons learned. Lessons learned. <laughs> be yeah, be careful with your... Um, Narsets. With, with sacrificing your uh, sacrificing your Uro too many times. So Caleb then moves to his end step, and then Thassa is going to trigger. He blinks the Venser and returns the Heartless Hidasegu back to Griffin's hand. And he has hit his devotion to seven. Yep, so he's going to get that two points here, um, just like Landa did earlier. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He plays Temple of the False God as his land for turn. He casts Treasonous Ogre and then recasts his Hidasegu. And with nothing else, Griffin passes the turn over to Landon. Landon going to his turn, untaps all of his lands and draws. He then, missing a little bit of sequencing, casts Bear Umbra first on Spirit Dancer, not drawing because of Narset, and then casts Ajani's Chosen, which he probably should have done before. He then casts Overgrowth, targeting one of his lands, which triggers the Ajani's Chosen, giving him a 2-2 cat. He then casts Siona. When that enters the battlefield, he's going to look at the top seven cards of his library, and he's going to pick an aura and put it into his hand. He finds and put to hand Wild Growth, which he then immediately casts, getting another 2-2 cat from the Ajani's Chosen. He then casts Alpha Status, targeting Siona, getting a 2-2 cat and a 1-1 soldier, putting Spirit Dancer up to a 26-28. He then goes to combat and swings the unblockable spirit dancer at Griffin, killing Griffin and gaining land in 26 life and untapping all of his lands from the Bear Umbra. Rip in peace, Griffin. Uh, another yeah, one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. It's not really a case of he didn't really have anything on the board to block, more of there's no way to get around that un- unblockable 26, shrouded. 28, shrouded uh, core spirit dancer that's coming at him. Just a, a ton of value on that creature. So, uh, so yeah, Griffin, he came out strong, but he didn't end up making it in the end. 
Landon then casts Oromancer, returning the Song of the Dryads back to his hand. He then casts the Song of the Dryads, targeting Thassa, to which Caleb responds with a timely ghostly flicker, blinking Thassa and the Torrential Gear Hulk, targeting nothing with the Gear Hulk re-entering. And the Song of the Dryads, having no targets, is sacrificed and goes back to his graveyard. Landon then casts Altar of Dementia, and with nothing else, passes the turn, with a lot of land and a lot of potential for the altar. Yeah, Altar of Dementia is critical at this point. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're we telling you, that Spirit Dancer is huge. That's gonna be a lot of mill, and even though this isn't really a mill strategy, it could be a viable way to end the game. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays down an island as his land for turn. Caleb then casts Diluvian Primordial, looking at Landon's graveyard, and decides to cast the Nature's Claim, destroying the Candy Bee cover, which is giving the Spirit Dancer Shroud. Landon will also gain 4 life off of the resolution of that spell. Caleb then activates Narset, digging to find some type of answer for Landon's board, and reveals a gush from the top and with nothing else wanting to hold up mana for some answers, goes to his end step, blinking the Gear Hulk with with Thassa and casting Ghostly Flicker from his graveyard, blinking Venture and the Primordial. Venture is going to target the Spirit Dancer, to which Landon responds by sacrificing the Spirit Dancer to the Altar of Dementia, which will mill Caleb for 27 cards. Spirit Dancer is then going to return to the battlefield because the Gift of Immortality saw the Spirit Dancer die, but all of the rest of the auras are going to go to Landon's graveyard. Yeah, Gift of Immortality doesn't return here because the end step already started for Caleb, uh, but um, but he should get it back at the end of his turn, uh, at Landon's turn. The Primordial re-entering is then going to target the Swords to Plowshares in Landon's graveyard, which Caleb points at Siona, to which Landon responds, sacrificing it to the altar, milling Caleb for another 14 cards, and he puts Siona back into the command zone. So, so Landon just ended up milling Caleb for 41 cards, which isn't really what this deck is aiming to do, but it seems to be working for him, and he, he, I, he might be able to close out the game this turn. With uh, no further game actions, Landon starts his turn. Uno. He did say Uno. Oh, it looks like uh, Griffin said Uno. He's still in it. He's still in it. Still some paying points. attention. <laughs> yep, so he, he gets one point there um, because Landon only has one card in his hand at this point. Uh, yeah, Griffin's feeling really good about that part. Landon untaps and draws and recasts Siona, which is going to trigger when she enters the battlefield, and he's going to reveal the top seven cards of his library, and he's going to put Felidar Umbra into his hand. Landon then casts the Felidar Umbra, to which Caleb responds with a gush, hoping to find some type of answer drawing two cards, but doesn't seem to hit anything. A Johnny's Chosen is going to trigger off of the Felidar Umbra, and Landon's going to make a 2-2 two -two cat, and Siona will trigger off the Felidar Umbra, which is going to make him a 1-1 one -one soldier. He is then going to activate the activated ability on the Felidar Umbra, which says for one and a white, he can reattach it to any creature, which is going to trigger the wording on Siona, which says whenever an enchantment, whenever an aura attaches it to a creature you control, you make a soldier. He does this five times, making five more soldiers. Super, super useful card in this deck uh, to, to be able to reattach a card just by paying two mana. I, I mean, it's it's everything that Siona wants, really. Felidar Umbra winds up attached to the Spirit Dancer, and after that's done, he casts Battle Mastery targeting the Spirit Dancer, giving him another 2-2 cat and a 1-1 soldier. At this point, Landon is very curious to find out how many cards is left in Caleb's library. 33. To which Caleb, after counting, says 33. Landon counts up the total power he has on board and finds out that he's one power short of milling Caleb completely out. At this point, he then remembers that the Gift of Immortality will be coming back at the end of the turn, which will give him the last soldier that he needs off of Siona to be able to mill Caleb out completely. He moves to his end step, returning the Gift of Immortality and putting it on the Spirit Dancer, which triggers Siona. He then moves to sacrifice his entire board with 12 power coming from the cats, 9 power coming from the soldiers, 2 power coming from Danita, 2 from the Oromancer, 7 from the Spirit Dancer, and 3 from the Ajani's Chosen with a total of 35 power power total, milling Caleb for 35. With no cards left in his library, Landon passes to Caleb. And Caleb's unable to draw, so Landon wins. That was quite the game. Thank you guys so much for hanging in there to the end and watching all this craziness unfold. Honestly, I thought I was dead on board after that Heartless Hidasegu trigger and taking all that damage from Perforos. I actually kind of gave up when I saw that I had three life left and a clean board, but 
just goes to show that if you stick in the game and don't give up, sometimes you can turn it around and come and things come back into your favor. And I think that's just the beauty of Commander. Yeah, lesson learned for Peter there as well. If you stick it in and don't sacrifice your entire board, maybe you could have made it out of there. But, um, but you know, lessons, hindsight, lessons learned from Commander. <laughs> hindsight is twenty twenty. Peter's going to go over the summary of the points for the game and tally up who has the most points and how many points were earned. Yep. So to start out, Caleb, uh, he earned the least points in this game he earned two points and that was from hitting him hitting his devotion devotion to blue and so with his six points from the last game that's going to bring him up to eight points at the end of this game next uh griffin he gained three points this game uh it was two points from hitting his personal challenge as well as one point for saying uno right there at the end he almost hit his devotion but not quite so uh he's going to end up with a grand total of five points um adding to the last game. Peter is also going to get three points from hitting that CMC challenge, uh, but he doesn't end up hitting his devotion or anything else, so he's going to end up with six points as his ground total. And then Landon is going to come walk away with the, the most points from this game. He won the game, so that gives him three points, and he hit his devotion, uh, which gives him two more points, adding up to adding to his three points from the last game grand total of eight points so at the end of this game caleb and landon are tied for first place peter's in third and griffin's in last next just as an added bonus we're going to go over our opinion on the most important card in the game and the most important play of the game i think that the most important play of the game was the turn that showcased how powerful griffin's deck actually was when he finally was able to untap with perforos he was able to do over 20 damage to all of us and that really just changed the entire dynamic of the game which also shows that the most important card of the game was probably song of the dryads that was able to keep perforos away from most of the game and if if griffin would have had access to perforos the whole game he most definitely would have won song of the dryads is probably one of the best commander hosers that exists in the game uh, turning something into a basic land basic is, forest is basic <laughs> forest you know especially against a red deck i mean like they're, 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 that's absolutely useless on the board and that really uh, that was really the downfall of griffin if that song of the dryads wasn't there uh, i don't i don't think anyone would have been able to deal with that board his his deck is insanely fast as showcased in that in that key play of the game um and and song of the dryads is an all-star in dealing with that thank you guys again so much for watching this game make sure you you go and watch the deck text dedicated to each of these commanders like peter said at the beginning we do have deck text done for each of these so if you're curious to see all the cards in this deck that maybe we weren't able to see in this game we have those ready for you and be sure you stay tuned for future duels of the peaks that will be coming out every month based around some type of theme we've also got other deck text from theros beyond death that we've been releasing for the last two months here since the since the set was spoiled go ahead and check those out we also started a new series called combo breaker uh, where we go over uh, popular combos and how to stop them and how to protect them in your own decks uh, we did one on heliod and walking ballista so be sure to check that out as well uh, and and be yeah we as landon said be watching this space for more duel of the peaks episodes as well as lots more deck texts and podcast episodes coming out very soon thanks guys have a great weekend